Okay. Hey guys, welcome to Button Adventures, fitness, boxing, and farming goat therapy. With all the constant confusion in the mainstream media about what a healthy lifestyle is like, our main goal here at Button Adventures is about making health fun and easy for you. I'm Coach Lita, and I have a background of a Bachelor of Sciences in Nursing with experience in geriatric, mental health, and long-term care. My boxing career consisted of 45 amateur fights, winning the Canadian Light Welterweight Golden Glove Championship in 2013, and a record of one and one as a professional fighter. In 2017, I was voted FAB Female Health and Wellness Entrepreneur of the Year in Greater Toronto Area. As a coach full-time for the last eight years and a proud goat mom of 11, yes, I said 11, Nigerian dwarf goats, I specialize in animal therapy and coaching people uh, to move beyond their perceived limitations and find their inner athlete through the sport of contact and non-contact boxing. Welcome to the weekly goat blog. Why goat, you may ask. Well, I grew up on a 300 acre farm with cows and horses and there it's huge and hard to maintain. Kind of like the information overload in society about what is healthy and not healthy. Goat, however, is great because they're tiny little lumps of turds, kind of like rabbit turds, making it easy to clean up and fertilize your garden with. Then as a boxer with 45 amateur fights and one-on-one -on -one as a professional fighter, when I train and visualize my success, in my mind, I was always the GOAT, the greatest of all time. When you box to be a winner, you need to tap into that mentality. But being a GOAT does not mean you have to get into, step into the ring and actually fight. It's about using the tips from this GOAT blog to sprinkle inspiration, motivation, and insight to use into your own life. That's my goal here with Button Adventures GOAT blog to give you that digestible fertilizer to grow your own greatest of all time mindset. So make sure you hit our like and follow button on Instagram, Facebook, and smash that subscribe button on YouTube. So today we have special guest, Jennifer Huggins. Jennifer is a multi-dimensional bundle of energy who has big dreams and several diving, diverging career interests. She's an entrepreneur, a boxing coach, an international referee, a magician's assistant, and the force behind Fight to End Cancer. Jennifer began following her dreams at a young age when she devoted nearly the first half of her life to the sport of competitive figure skating. She met with an unfortunate accident that cut her skating career short, and during rehabilitation, Jennifer turned to the sport of boxing both as strengthening activity and a therapeutic tool. Her passion grew from there, and in 2006, she opened the very successful Kingsway Boxing Club. Her entrepreneurial spirit and success allowed Jennifer the rare opportunity to impact two of her greatest loves, the sport of boxing and community service. Jennifer traveled the world over the past decade, performing on some of the grandest stages as an assistant to a professional magician. How cool is that? And then on top of this, um, her business commitments as well. Fight to End Cancer was conceived in 2011 with her love of boxing, business, and entertainment. Woo -woo. She oversees the day-to-day -day management of the Fight to End Cancer as the executive director, and along with her executive planning team, is on a mission to make it one of the top fundraisers, both locally and abroad. Jennifer was awarded the 2017 Ron Wally Memorial Award for Official of the Year by Boxing Canada. Woo -woo. She was honored to share the stage with Canada's Female Boxer of the Year and previous Goat Shit Blog uh, interviewee, Mandy Bujo, and Male Boxer of the Year, Arthur Borez Berioslanov and the inspiring Yvonne Michael, who have helped pave the way for the future of boxing. She was recently awarded the 2020 Women in Sport Achievement by the International Olympic Committee. And now she divides her time between her role with the Fight to End Cancer, running the Kingsway Boxing Club, and traveling the world as both a referee for Olympic boxing at the international level and as a performer. 
The fact that she accomplishes so much is truly magic. Giving back to the community that has supported her businesses and personal growth has become integral to her life. Jennifer's personal and business motto is variety is the spice of life. Ain't that true? <laughs> yeah, it's funny hearing it. I probably have to update some of that. But uh, yeah, variety is the spice of life. And uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't try everything, how are you going to know what you love? <laughs> so. And there's so many things in life to discover, right? So, um, especially when you're a passionate person, uh, exactly. and I know why not. I, now I have to try goat. Uh, goat. I don't have the emoji, but I gotta try some of your goat stuff. <laughs> oh well, when you and your family come to Newfoundland, it'd be awesome to have you um, come with the the goats. Goats on the walk on the rock. <laughs> Can't wait. We walk Can't along wait. the beautiful shore. Okay, so Jen. Um, let us know a little bit why you do what you do. Like there's the biography and then there's your life that you live each and every day with the many hats that you put on. And I definitely want to dive into the magician because I mean, I've known you through the boxing world for how long, but I didn't realize that the magic part of it was a big part of your background. So that's incredible. It's really cool. Yeah, you know what, the long and short of it really is I lived, uh, as you mentioned, I lived the first half of my life, uh, I guess I can't say that anymore, because it was actually uh, I wrote that was written for me when that was the first half of my life. And now I'm, I'm 40. So uh, it, first, I would say, two thirds of my life <laughs> was, uh, was figure skating. And it was the only thing I was doing I, It was my focus, my goals, my life, my, my sleep, my dreams, everything. And when I stopped doing it, um, it was forcefully taken away from me. But at the same time, I don't think I realized that there were so many other things out there. And I kind of went from being confined to the small space where it was my entire world to realizing that there is quite a big world out there. And I went from one thing to realizing I want to do everything. I, I wanted to catch up on the, the world around me. I didn't want to say no to anything because I had to say no to so many things. I mean, right down to the TV that I used to watch, uh, the food that I used to eat, the friends I used to be able to make. I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things the way that most children are allowed to do it, or maybe not the most children, but the way that I kind of perceive society will allow children to grow and the way that I want to raise my child. Um, not to say my parents didn't do an amazing job. It's just, it was a different life. And when my world opened up, I didn't want to stop running with it. And I haven't stopped since. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. So what, how old were you when you first started figure skating? And then how old were you when you stopped just to give kind of everybody a little bit of a picture of your childhood? Yeah, so I started, I started figure skating when I was about just a little bit before four years old. So I was three turning four, and I became competitive when I was five. Uh, who knew wow. they had a figure skating at five years old, but it turned me into a very competitive person. Uh, to the core. I, I retribute my competitive nature to the life that I lived as a figure skater. Um, I skated and I was on the uh, national, not the national team, I was on the national run. So I was working towards uh, my Olympic goal as a figure skater all the way up until I was 14 years old. And I sustained a neck injury, which uh, put me in hospital. I was in traction at Sick Kids Hospital. I know your son spent some time at Sick Kids, amazing hospital. Um, yeah. I'm actually growing up, I had asthma and I spent, I remember there was one time I spent Christmas in hospital. I don't know if you ever had to do that with your son. But it, it, I used to ask my parents, can I go back every year during Christmas? Because I got so <laughs> much from that Santa. Uh, so nothing to feel bad about other than that it really it was kind of that shock into reality where when I lost everything at 14, it's that that's a really critical age for any any child. But yes. for me, it was my life had stopped as I knew it. I was ready to get back. My only goal to get through the treatment as quickly as I could was that I wanted to get back on the ice. That's all I knew. Uh, but yeah. I, I made a full recovery when I did get back on the ice. I didn't love it anymore. I don't think I loved it for a while, but it gave me that space to realize that there's other things out there. There's, there's other, there's just, there's a whole world out there. So I ended yes. up in rehab when I was in rehab, it, the rehab was a fairly long process. The hospital was one portion of it. And then there was the physio and that's actually where I walked into while I was doing physio, I walked into a boxing gym that was uh, next to a physio clinic that I was going to and oh? tried on a pair of boxing gloves. Actually the coach, um, Kevin Hurley, I don't know if he's still on the scene right now. I've, I've run into him a couple of times at the, uh, at fights, 
um, Kevin Hurley, there's two of them. One Kevin Hurley who works with Boxing Ontario uh, and helps out a lot. And then other Kevin Hurley used to be a professional fighter, amateur fighter, um, just told me, put on a pair of gloves and try it out. And I was like, this is something my parents would never let me do. Let me try it. <laughs> so, um, at that was about 16 years old, threw on my first pair of gloves, threw my first punches and fell in love. And yeah. it was just that freedom to do things a little bit I, there's a lot of technical and I realize that now as a, as a coach, especially as a official, there's a lot of technical behind boxing, but the freedom of throwing punches and using your body in a capacity that figure skating was so technical and so rigid, uh, boxing, just the power was unleashed, uh, literally. And it, I've never turned back. Nice. That's incredible. So that's been since you were 16 till now. Mm-hmm. 16 to 40. Oh my gosh. Where did time go? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, it goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so you you like kind of lead us down a little bit of your your boxing path, like how that went and in, into coaching, yeah. into officiating, because I've always known you as an official. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so I mean, I guess again, the fact that now my gym has been what twenty years. I've been almost twenty years. It's going to be nineteen years right now. Um, it's been a long journey. Uh, I had a short stint as an, as an official, as an official, a short stint as a boxer. Uh, I started off as a boxer um, training. And then, of course, because my competitive nature wanted to get a fight in there. I did three fights, found myself having a hard time finding fights at the time. I didn't really have, I mean, Kevin started off as my coach, but I didn't have really great direction at the time. I didn't know where to find good coaching. I didn't know where to find coaching at all. Actually, at one point, I was just like, okay, you know, let me just find fights myself. Um, that being said, there weren't as many women boxers at the time. This is, uh, going yeah. back, I guess, 20 years, uh, almost 20 years ago was my last fight. It wasn't the same scene as it is now, even though I know there's still a struggle for women to find, uh, matches, there's a little bit more support. There's a female development uh, committee now with boxing Ontario. There's a lot of initiatives, uh, and there's social media. I, I don't think that, I don't think there was, so, I don't, yeah, there was not social media back when I first started boxing, not to the extent there is now. Um, and then once I realized that it was going to be a challenge for me to find bouts, um, I just wanted to share the sport with other people. Uh, that actually happened while I was competing. I found myself wanting to share boxing because it was making such a big difference in my life. And the only yeah. thing I don't want to do with that kind of feeling is share it. So as a little 17 year old, actually, I started uh, personal training at a gym um, in Toronto, uh, back of, in the days of Premier Fitness. Those of you who are watching this might remember that. Uh, that ah! um, <laughs> yeah, like everybody's Premier ever touched on a lot of people in the Ontario boxing scene. Yeah, I was about to say everybody that I know who has who's been around for more than 20 years in this in the industry has gone through Premier Fitness at some some point. Um, so I started my programs in Premier Fitness, but I had to be a personal trainer because they didn't really believe in the boxing, though they did have boxing studios and people would always kind of dabble in it a lot of boxers actually would box through and came through premier fitness as well uh just because they had such a great facility but they didn't necessarily have consistent coaches um and then i moved on to different clubs actually started my own programs at uh women's gyms uh there was a, a few women's gyms at the time uh ran them through uh the bally's um i think it was sports clubs of canada at the time so i just started kind of dabbling and running my own business not because I was entrepreneurial or I was, I didn't realize it, but because yeah. there wasn't, there wasn't an opportunity or a platform by which I can actually offer these programs that were existing. So started just offering these programs at different gyms uh, for a good period of time. Um, it's actually where I met my now husband. Uh, he was working at premier fitness. He was just in the ring, kind of one of, uh, I'm sure you, many of you've heard of Tommy Howitt, uh, coach and uh, awesome guy Yeah, uh, had Virgil. He was coaching at premier. He had Virgil, going round and round with different people. And he was just getting, you know, not punched, but people were trying to punch him. And uh, that was their workout. And I took him and he was really great as a coach. And he knew how to keep the ladies, uh, gyms happy because number one, he was a great, uh, charming guy, but also great coach. who didn't, um, yell at the women for trying to talk during class. I was like, no, <laughs> you're, not you're not here to talk. So he was really good for the, uh, maintenance of, um, of keeping the clients once I got them. Um, and just went from there. And at a certain point uh, in 20, 2005, I realized that I needed to slow down a little bit if I want to get back into the ring or stay in the ring. And I wanted to, my actual goal with Virgil um, at the time was to go pro. I was like, oh yeah, three fights. That's enough. I'm going to go pro. Not because I knew any better, but because I didn't know where to start. I didn't know where to finish. I didn't know anything about the scene properly when it came to competition. Right. So right. I was not knowing, ended up starting my own boxing gym in my apartment. 
um, bringing, okay. the, <laughs> bringing the athletes to me so I could train again properly. So Virgil could train properly. Uh, he continued fighting actually. Um, and basically by accident started a boxing gym and found out that it wasn't about me anymore. It was about the people that I was bringing through the gym. Um, and the fighters that potentially, uh, actually that's where it started at the fighters that I was working with at some of these clubs came to me and wanted to fight and wanted to compete. So I had to legitimize my gym, uh, had Sonny Wong, um, who at the time was chief official of Ontario, became chief official of Canada, yeah. went on to do many great things internationally, um, has done many great things internationally as an official as well, inspired me to become an official. He came into my little apartment at the time. It was a little tiny apartment with, uh, actually it wasn't tiny. It was pretty big for me had a studio in the front studio in the back and bags hanging from the ceiling. And he's like, this is cute. Uh, why don't you? <laughs> he's like, I'm going to pass this location. Uh, obviously you can't really have sparring here, but why don't you get involved as an official so you can kind of see what is needed and what's out there. And first thing I did was, uh, sign myself up for an officiating course. Uh, ended up as a judge at first referee right away as soon as I could. And, uh, just from there ended up taking it step by step further and further until I uh, fortunately I was seen by the right people that's a big part of it and uh about 10 years ago just over 10 years ago uh picked up by uh the International Boxing Association um to referee and judge internationally and then on the Olympic pathway so super super fortunate to be seen by the right people directed by the right people and uh at a time where again social media wasn't big I didn't know who Sonny was until he walked into my apartment um yeah but- but they they all cared and they all saw someone who was very ambitious, just had no direction. And that is where I find purpose now, helping people like myself um, could be a lot of more misdirection now with the social media out there. So yeah. helping give people good information and uh, set them on the right path and open up their worlds the way that mine has been opened up by a sport that's so incredible. Yeah, that's uh... <laughs> that is quite the journey. But it's really interesting that you said that the right direction, it's a um sometimes like one of those euphemisms that you used when the pupil's ready um the mentor the coach the teacher will appear right so that's definitely the pathway that you've shown over the last uh 10 plus years which is really cool so will you be will you be refereeing this at the summer at the 2024 olympics then so I was, uh, I haven't shared this yet with many people, uh, so I guess I'm sharing it with the world right now, but I was on the, okay. I was on the pathway um, for the Paris, uh, for the Paris Olympics. I did the uh, Asian Olympic qualifiers in China just this past uh, September, October. Uh, unfortunately, I, I've had to cut my uh, journey short. I had to turn down a couple of assignments that would have actually cut me on the pathway for Paris. Um, just personal decisions. Uh, it just wasn't the right time very tough decisions, but at the same time, um, I'm finding really, really cool opportunities. Uh, One of the big announcements was uh, working with the Ministry of Sport in uh, Ontario, um, and also working with World Boxing in a capacity that uh, is, World Boxing is our new uh, international federation for boxing. Okay. Um, So working on a committee within World Boxing that's gonna help get competition up and running in, um, I guess, sustainable way so that hopefully working towards LA 2028 Olympics uh, in whatever way that I can work in. Uh, but yeah, it's been a, it's been definitely a journey. I have no regrets, but at the same time, a little bit of a disappointing one for Paris. Um, however, I can say that there is a couple of Canadian uh, officials who've been on the path for more, probably double the decades that I've been involved, um, who are on the pathway right now. Eddie, um, uh, Eddie from out East, uh, you might know him. Um, Blanchard is uh, going out to Milan shortly uh, in March. And Wade Peterson, another official who's been in the game for double the amount of time, at least actually maybe triple the amount of time that I have, uh, both amazing officials who are mentors to me as well. So those two are right now on the pathway and I wish for them to uh, to be able to represent Canada. It's, there's nothing more amazing than being able to represent Canada on an international Olympic stage. Yeah, yeah, it's really, that's really awesome. So we'll, we'll keep our eye out and keep watching you for the 2028. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, will, I will too. It's it's, a, it's funny enough. It's actually in some ways, uh, I, I know I want to be careful how I say this, but it's a more competitive um, stream in the sense of there's less spots as officials than there are as athletes yeah. even. So there's like 30, yeah. Eight or 40 it depends on how many they take official spots uh from all across the world like you know different countries are a lot and sometimes they take two from each country but usually it's from different countries um uh, and then the athletes there's i and i don't want to quote this one i believe it's 284 spots so 
while it's ridiculously competitive getting as an athlete, there's just less spots as official. So it's surprisingly yeah. well in a different way. Really cool. Very cool. Okay. Well, that being said, is there any kind of like any misconceptions that you've come across that people think about what you do as an, uh, as an official, any kind of things that have come up um, that people say regularly to you or, you know, um, kind of just, um, Buff out those misconceptions that you've come across. Educate. Yeah, it's really it's really changed. Uh, I mean, if you asked me that ten years ago, I think that people would have assumed that you know I'm a female. I'm getting in the ring with female boxers. I wish that was the case. I wish it was only female boxers because that means there would be so many female boxers that I would have nothing else to do other than female boxing. But unfortunately, uh, we are we are evening out that disparity. There's you know, especially even in the Paris Olympics, there's more not equal but more females involved than when in 2012 when we first had the um london olympics uh inch by inch we're getting we're getting there um however there's not so many females in boxing that i can only referee and judge females for the most part i'll go to competitions i'll go to international competitions some of them are male only tournaments um yep and i mean so years ago people had that misconception. I think now with social media, people see that, you know, I'm in the ring, I'm doing mostly the, the posts that I have is with male boxers. Uh, and I'm so honored when I have the chance to share the ring with female boxers. I've been, uh, I've been fortunate to do pretty much since I've been an official internationally every year, I've been able to do the women's uh, world championships, which is incredible. Um, current misconceptions actually surround not so much my experience, but uh, a lot of boxers, coaches, um, people who are just in the industry are scared to become officials because they're worried that potentially there will be bias on their side um, and they're worried how it'll look or they'll worried how it'll impact their current role within the sport. And I think that if there's one thing that I can say about a good official is that they're not biased. Um, it's taught me how to be a very neutral individual who comes in with a very open mind and challenges those bias. We all have bias. We all have unconscious bias. We all have conscious bias and we have to work against those to make sure that we remain fair and remain just within the actual society, within our community, let alone inside the ring. So I would say a big misconception is just that if you are becoming an official, that somehow you're taking sides, that you're somehow, you're not allowed to be a coach, not allowed to be a boxer. There, there are certain things. So for example, me at the international level, I can no longer coach nationally. I coach within my club and I continue to do that because I love sharing the sport with young athletes um, or more mature athletes, but I love sharing the sport. Um, and I love to share the things that I've learned as an official. Um, but that's because I'm an international official. I cannot do coaching at the national, even I, I wouldn't even at this point right now, just for there's perceived bias as well I, for the perception of it. I stay away yeah. from being ringside, you know, yelling at another athlete or yelling at my athlete to, you know, you know, go after them for this thing, the next things that I see. But I would say the local shows, people getting involved, there is something that uh, was said to me in the uh, from a Muay Thai official when I asked them, I said, oh, doesn't it seem kind of weird that you're refereeing and judging and then all of a sudden you're coaching on the same show? And they said, no, it just it gives me more credibility within the actual uh, sport. People know me as a coach. They know me as a, an athlete pre previously. They know me as an official. They know I'm fair. They know I, I'm educated. So I think that 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 is something, a misconception I'd love to start breaking a little bit more, get more people involved because the more people, athletes, uh, coaches that you have involved on this side of it, on the officiating side, the more educated they're going to be, the better the sport's going to be, the better the athletes are going to do internationally and nationally. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you for breaking it down um, and giving us a different analysis on what will help uh, make the sport better, uh, especially for females in the sport. And um, I, so can you like, Give us a little bit of the journey from 2012 2016 2020 and now uh because you're deep you're deep in that pocket because there was only three weight classes in 2012 and if my memory serves me correct when i was looking at things there were six weight categories for women in 2016 right and how many weight categories do we have now yeah we're uh we're at seven i believe now I, I have to double check i keep on changing the weight categories but um by next Olympics, we're going to be even, I believe it's going to be eight and eight. Um, okay. So the goal is that, that fair equality. Uh, I mean, there's, there's equality and there's equity. And I mean, those women who are watching, who've kind of been through it, understand that equality is not always equity. You may yeah. have spots for the woman, but if you don't have the, um, if we don't have the, I guess, 
pathway or we don't have the, I, I would just say that we need to create more opportunities for women so that we do the same, I guess, I, I don't know how to say it any other way than we just need to make sure that there's opportunities there for the woman so that when they do shine at the Olympics, they're getting the same kind of uh, attention, but also they've had the same experience leading up. There's just a lot of male um, tournaments out there. There's a lot more males out there still. So the experience level that they're getting sometimes is a lot more, a lot, uh, a lot greater than some of the women. We're definitely getting out there. There's actually women's only tournaments now. Um, yeah. there's a golden girl, I think coming up it, there's, there's a lot, but there's just not as much yet. So I would say that the quality is getting there. The equity needs to kind of grow a little bit still. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you for explaining that. That's a really great uh, explanation because there, there are quite a bit of dis disparities in these things. So amazing. Um, so you've been always super competitive. Uh, which is awesome because those of us that are competitive as well in most of our lives can totally relate. But what has motivated and inspired you to keep doing what you're doing, like officiating and coaching and taking on all these hats and then um, keep moving forward? So is there something that you keep revisiting every day? Is there like, where do you draw from your motivation and inspiration? Because um, you got a lot going on. Yeah, you know, it started off as a me thing. It started off as I was competitive. I wanted to be the best. I wanted to, you know, sh prove myself. Actually, I think that was a big part of it. I wanted to prove myself in the industry. I wanted to prove myself in the sport. Um, and weirdly enough, it was actually one of my mentors who told me this. One day I'll wake up and people will just have this kind of innate respect for what I've done and know that I can do it. And that's a lot harder. It was a lot easier for me to want to prove myself than to meet up other people's expectations. So now what motivates me is ensuring that I am actually providing um, some sort of not just service to the community, but value to every single person who comes into my gym, comes into my life, walks into the ring with me as an, uh, I mean, the boxers don't get to choose if I'm an official for them. So yeah. it's no longer a me journey. It's the fact that the, what I provide to people, the experience that I've got now is only as valuable as I can make it to others. So I really, yes, I want to be the best. I think that it's important not to me just to be the best, but to the, the athletes who are dedicating their lives to the sport um, to continue to be, you know, one of the best officials out there that they can trust. And at least at the very most guarantee that if they do their part, I've done mine and there's no worry there. So that's definitely been a huge part of uh, my journey as an official at the international level, uh, as a coach, again, same thing. It's sometimes the hardest thing, and you know, this owning a gym yourself, sometimes the hardest thing is for someone to walk into that gym. I want to make that, yeah, yeah I want to make that the, the only thing that's difficult for them. Uh, we've got young athletes. Uh, some of them are from high risk neighborhoods. Um, they're living lives that potentially without the uh, sport of boxing in it could be very different. Um, we realize that as a, as a club, as a, as a family and as a boxing family. And I think that that purpose alone, it drives every day more and more the need for me to be innovative, find ways to touch more people and be of greater value to the ones that do enter my, enter my life or enter the ring with me. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so what have been your three toughest obstacles kind of reaching your goals? Do you have specific goals that you kind of work towards each time? Or are you just like, <laughs> uh, you know, like Yvette and I are like, we're super like, oh my goodness, we get excited about things and we just got to like chunk it down and like, you can't like take on too much. So do you break it down for yourself all the time or um, is it just more of the journey that you're loving? Yeah, three big, uh, three biggest obstacles. Me, myself, and I. Uh, honestly, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. I mean, I guess fight tan cancer has changed my perspective on what obstacles really look like. Um, I can get up every morning. I mean, sometimes it's harder than others. Uh, you know, today's a today's a tired day, but it's that's nothing. It pales comparison to what someone fighting cancer has to go through every moment of their life. So I have no complaints. I have every opportunity and I have to make use of it now. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what, what next moment brings. So with that, I, I don't think that I'm in any capacity, you know, superhuman. I do burn out. Um, I will burn out. I'll continue to burn out, but I'll continue to burn out knowing that it's all worth it and uh, continue to explore different opportunities uh, that potentially could make greater impact. And really at the end of the day, 
it's, it is, it's me, myself and I, that'll be any barrier to succeed. Yes. There's obviously some of the social and economical challenges, um, cultural challenges, uh, but those are just challenges. Those are not barriers. Uh, my motto for fight tan cancer, uh, and the, the one we all live by within our family is defeat is not an option. Failure is going to happen. It's happened probably way more times that I could even, you know, I, I couldn't count. There's no way I could count. I think for every success, there has been just failure along the way, but that's the only way that you're going to figure out what doesn't work so you can make things work. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, incredible. Uh, one of the most impactful things that I've learned in the last few months taking the neuro linguistic coaching course is um, in it, it really talks about um, there's no such thing as failure there's only feedback like as long as you keep moving forwards and you're taking the feedback to get the results that you want um that's that's it and defeat is not an option is definitely sums that up in another different way to say that and uh i think that's definitely the fighting spirit for those of us that keep pushing forwards in this industry um because boxing is the toughest sport (laughs) (laughs) um so has there been like three specific highlights of your career? And it doesn't necessarily have to relate to boxing. Uh, I'm totally curious about the magician stuff because I had no idea. <laughs> Wait, you keep asking about that. Um, yeah, oh, I, would, I, would, <laughs> I would say uh, I, in, in no specific order. First one that comes to mind is when, again, I, I said there was a bit of luck um, in being fortunate to being chosen for specific specific roles that I've found myself in. Uh, so being an international official, uh, a lot of people ask me how to get there and the pathway is not so direct. Um, sometimes it just, it really has to be, it has to do with being seen by the right people and being helped by the right people. Um, so kind of that pivotal moment in 2014, when I was, it was actually 2013, it started, but 2014, when I was pretty much hand selected by the uh, instructors at a upgrade course for, um, at the time it was IABA. Um, looking at me and saying, you know what, she's got potential, you know, I needed a lot of work, but at the same time, they saw the potential that I was, you know, had all the drive in the world, but I didn't necessarily know where it was going. So uh, being selected for the international officiating and being fast tracked at the time, um, it was, I was in over my head at that time, but I've had to earn my way and my stay within the sport. So that was a huge pivotal moment for me. Um, Again, fortunate, um, a friend of mine uh, who actually no longer is with us, uh, she was being, she was actually a, a, a magician's assistant herself. And this is back when I was 18 years old and I was still searching. It took me from about 15 to about 20 to really find myself. 21 was when I started uh, Kingsway Boxing. Um, and she said to me, you know, hey, you know, if I can never make a gig or if I can't make a gig, I used to be because of figure skating a dancer and I used to have a lot of kind of the performance uh, that was part of my life. It was part of who I was. Um, so I said to her, yeah, if you if you ever can't make a gig, just let me know. And uh, she fell in love with uh, she was her first gig was uh, Monte Carlo, Paris and L.A. She fell in love with L.A. <laughs> Yeah, that that was her tour. Uh, she fell in love with L.A. and then stayed wanted to stay there. So she said, hey, Jen, I have another tour booked. Um, do you want to take it? And I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. After hearing Monte Carlo, Paris in L.A. And yeah. I, I ended up taking a, an East Coast tour, which is gorgeous. East Coast tour of Canada um, with the Shrine Fantasy Tour. That was my very first uh, very first tour as a magician's assistant. And it was so much fun uh, staying at some of the uh, cheapest hotels across uh, Quebec. Those were really interesting. <laughs> But uh, it formed and shaped the person I am today, too. So that was number two that comes to mind. And uh, number three that comes to mind, again, in no specific order, they're all very equally important to me, was um, the opportunity, uh, again, accidental start of Kingsway Boxing. It set me down a pathway of true purpose rather than just kind of all over the place. As you can tell, I am all over the place. It all kind of does fit in together. And I I don't know if we have time to even draw that relationship, but uh founding Kingsway and having the support to do that and my now husband uh, supporting that journey and being part of it um feeling super super fortunate that that came about because really it could have gone in so many different directions for me and the boxing gym is the one that's kept me stable yeah yeah wow that's uh have you ever thought about writing a book uh, not um, yet <laughs> not yet I think I, I do agree that I think everyone should have a book uh, a memoir of some sort and uh, my producer from the ma- magic uh, 
side of my life. I mean, I've traveled the world with my magician, but the producer from the one that I did the East Coast tour with wrote a beautiful uh, kind of memoir and collection of stories from his uh, 25 years, I think of uh, 28 years of running his tour. And uh, it's so nice to read it as somebody who cares about him, someone who has been a part of a little piece of his life to hear and read those things is pretty incredible because it's just, it's a world I never experienced outside of, you know, the little parts that I have. Uh, so yeah, I, I haven't necessarily thought about it really. I, I don't feel like I've lived or done enough to warrant um, me writing a book, but eventually I think that's a, it's a nice idea for everyone to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, <laughs> there's, I feel like there's a lot to unpack there that it, the different chapters of it. Really cool. Um, so have you ever wanted to quit along the way? Sorry, have I ever wanted to quit? Quit anything? Yeah. Um, I guess it's tough to say. Like figure skating for me, I feel as though I never completed that journey. I still perform professionally on stage. Uh, that's actually part of what I do with Magician. Um, I've had I've had really cool opportunities to work with uh, Feldner, Feldner Entertainment, Disney on Ice, things like that that continue the journey. But my goal was the Olympics. And I feel like by not continuing, I quit. But I think I need to realign my <clears throat> my perspective a little bit. Um, I don't believe that we quit in life. I believe that our pathways take us in different directions. I I could be looked at as though I didn't, you know, same thing right now with uh, the Paris Olympics as a referee and judge. I'm kind of hitting um, that crossroads. Do I continue being a referee and judge? in hopes of continuing as a referee and judge at the LA Olympics, or do I continue a different pathway and find myself in the LA Olympics in a different capacity? I don't know. Would it be quitting in some people's eyes? Yeah. Um, am I going to stick with it? I really hope so. I would have no reason not to, unless something comes up that stops me from doing that. But uh, no, I've never wanted to quit. I do believe that it sometimes feels like it, but it just is a journey towards a different pathway that ends up opening other doors and starts new journeys. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a beautiful articulation of it. Thank you for sharing it. Do you have a definition of success that you like to use as you're walking out your, your journey and your pathway? I think I've been asked this before and I think it changes. I think right now I would define success as always moving forward, you know, not not necessarily standing still. You, you sometimes have to pause for a second, make sure you absorb and you you perfect. It's like boxing. Boxing is a great analogy for everything. You are never the best boxer in the world. I know we can call us ourselves the goat. You may be the greatest all time right now, but unless you keep on working forward and keep on getting better, there's always going to be someone at your coattails ready to take you down. And in life, it's the same thing in business. It's the same thing. You can't stand still. Um, you can pause, you can perfect, you can work on yourself and you need to do that all the way along. But as long as you're moving forward, you're succeeding at whatever you're doing and, you know, not working backward, but at the same time, sometimes reflecting is an important thing. Um, but I would say success is a journey and continuing on that journey. Uh, because again, we never know how long we've got and that journey can outlive you. And that's what I hope to do with the legacy of the fight to end cancer. Uh, what I hope to build in, you know, the young, you know, athlete, the seven-year-old, five-year-old who walks through the door, they can love boxing or at least have it integrated into their lives now and somehow to have direct them in a way that wouldn't have happened otherwise, then that's our legacy living through, you know, people that will far outlive us. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful articulation. Uh, and I, bringing it back to those of us that are in the boxing community, we're always saying this and we're always educating, but uh, being firm believers that boxing saves lives, right? It's that moving it and passing it forwards. So do you have a specific way that you're seeing yourself over the next few years besides what you kind of outlined for the 2028? Yeah. I mean, 2028 is always kind of the goalpost moves. I like that. Someone said that to me one time is that you, I asked them, it had nothing to do with what we're talking about. It was, he was uh, getting personal training from one of my trainers and he's like, I enjoyed it, but I didn't know what the, where the goal post was. And I think that we need to have the goal post. So we need to, you know, make sure we have our eyes set on something or some things that are going to keep us motivated, but that goal post may move. Um, I really, at the end of the day, I've got a lot of new, amazing things happening in my life right now. Personally, um, I want to make sure that at the very least I keep my my mind and my time and my heart open to 
taking new, take on new challenges while not burning out too much. So I think that's one of my biggest goals is to not burn out so that I can continue to work towards not just LA 2028, but to be involved in the sport in a capacity that is going to help grow it. And I am already doing many of those things and I'm really excited about them. So just making sure that I, every step of the way, instead of looking so far forward, which I've always done, you know, I've always had those ultimate goals, the small goals, the daily goals, that'll keep me on, on track to be able to succeed whatever direction they end up going. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so is there specifically like three pieces of advice or wisdom that you would like to uh, share so other people can sprinkle and add it to their, their own lives um, to like give a little bit of a goat, <laughs> goat perspective? <laughs> I feel like I should have. Uh, I think you probably sent these questions. I should have like prepared for that one. Um, three, three. I don't know. Let me let me come up with one. Number one is keep an open mind, keep an open heart, uh, and allow yourself to just do. Uh, so I think that, uh, for example, I had a big meeting with our fight Tan cancer team, but also some new people who are looking to get involved. And, uh, the, the starting point that I gave people was just start. Don't, don't talk about it too much. Don't try to, cause when you start something and when you just put it into action, it somehow finds a life of its own and it grows. And you have to grow around it and you have to help adapt and make sure that it, it succeeds, but it takes on a life of its own. And unless you start it, it doesn't, doesn't, you have to plant the seed and let it grow. Um, and I think a lot of people wait around, they, they do a lot of planning. And if one thing COVID I took out of COVID is that you can plan all you want, but you don't really, and I know that you struggled this one as well. You're kind of at the mercy of life and at the mercy of sometimes others. So you just have to keep adapting. So just yep. start now, start right now and run with it. And that would be my number one piece of advice. Um, number two piece of advice I'm trying to learn for myself is don't burn out. Make sure that yeah. you take care of yourself. Um, I've heard it always and, you know, I advocate for it, but I don't really live it myself. I, I, I usually push, push, push because, you know, who am I to rest when other people, you know, need it more than I do that's not necessarily a good strategy because then you're only as useful as your day allows. And if you're exhausted, then you can't really, you're exhausted physically, mentally, emotionally, you can't be of service to the community. You can't be of service to your, your clients or whoever you need to be of service to. Uh, so don't burn out. Number three, just enjoy, enjoy, take a, take a moment to enjoy. And again, something I'm guilty of not doing. I don't reflect a lot of the things that are going really well and that I should be probably proud of. Um, part of that comes from the way I was raised in figure skating. If you stop long enough to admire something, boxing to stop it long enough to admire that punch, you're gonna get punched by the next punch. Um, it's, <laughs> still, it's still important to maybe watch the video of your boxing so you can admire what you've done right. So you can replicate that and yeah. you need to do it right. And then find new skills. So I think in life, if you can just take a second to reflect and be proud and be, be happy with yourself and be, just, just be, be happy and learn how to enjoy life. Uh, that's what I'm working on right now as well. Yeah, beautiful. Um, is there anything else that you would like to to share with the um, watchers and yeah, um, your fan base and stuff as well? I uh, I mean, other than the fact that I'm really excited that Newfoundland has something going on, I, as you know, uh, I'm not sure how many people watching would know. I did have a short stint, especially during COVID, of being the president of Boxing Ontario, and one of the things that yeah. I was really fortunate with even though we were boxing was taken away from us was that our province had so many boxers and we had so many clubs um so just really cool how cool is it that uh you have a club in Newfoundland uh are you working sorry I just I, I wanted to bring it back to you for a second are you working yeah with, no. are you working with competitive boxers right now as well yeah I have a bunch and you know I <laughs> this is something I haven't posted on social media but this last week you know you know what I'm gonna say with Paul right Literally, most. Of I remember you were probably the first sofa I ever had to like <laughs> watch or be in the ring with. Then maybe most gyms will have like maybe a maximum of two sofas, mm -hmm. three sofas, and I have maybe like not even thirty members yet that have come in. Like, if I'm lucky, I haven't calculated all the numbers yet. But, um, and I probably have about eight sofas. Amazing, very cool. Yeah, <laughs> just like what is happening here? It's not a very big job population in Newfoundland and that so um yeah but uh I'm connected now with Hank Summers in yeah, Hank's, Hank's a legend man <laughs> that guy's been, yes. been in the sport forever and uh actually I'll be working the um Calgary Cup in March and I cannot wait okay. to 
hopefully see if you guys can get some athletes in there. You've you've had a great pass in Newfoundland of um of athletes who've gone pretty far. Uh, so yeah. I would love to see that back up again. So is Hank Hank's helping out with that? I don't know. I haven't just like literally opened two and a half weeks ago. So it's just okay. uh, I'm I'm a baby right now. <laughs> Well, as I said, just just do it. Get, get started if you can. I'm stealing someone else's. Yeah. If I just do it, but just get started. And uh, and honestly, there's uh, the fact that your province is it's pretty spread out, but there's not as much boxing as hopefully there will be. Um, you have great opportunity, and I think that it'd be great for the province um, for you to bring your expertise you've brought from that you've gotten from the sport yourself, but also from Ontario to bring it over to uh, Newfoundland would be great. I do have friends who go out to Newfoundland to box, so have to send them by your gym, and uh, hopefully we'll see yeah. that tournaments to come. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for joining us here today, uh, Jennifer. It was great to unpack everything and so many pieces of a passionate, uh, energetic wisdom in. I would say from, do you consider yourself a spiritual kind of person? Um, I would guess we all are. I, I yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I wouldn't define myself as that because I, I don't really know what it means. I'm still learning about myself, but yeah, for sure. Awesome. Um, and for those of you that are tuning in, make sure that you just subscribe to a button uh, email list. Cause for the next couple of months, there's a free goat goal getting guide that's there and it'll lead you on the pathway to getting your health optimal health um and then join us next week as i interview previous professional soccer player uh now turned professional boxer milad zaren so thank you so much for joining us here today everyone i hope you have an amazing rest of your week and we'll touch base again soon john amazing thank you bye